Um, all of these design considerations that we're stepping through here can all be cumulative or individual. I'll, I'll add that. Um, so pressure differentials are subject to uh, natural atmospheric conditions and mechanical influence. So best management practices include sealing all the exterior wall openings, sealing the HVAC ducts, and providing managed HVAC zones in the living areas. So this is pretty common knowledge, and um, we'll talk about some of these atmospheric conditions here in a bit. Thermal gradients are best managed by proper design of the thermal barriers and proper attic insulation. In my opinion, um, deciduous trees are, are, are kind of a good default to help manage some of the, the sun hitting your house, those types of things. So there may be some outside influences that have kind of helped manage some of those conditions. That's just an example. Um, but might want, to, might want to consider that as well. Vines, trellises along the side of the house, not on the house, but trellises where the vines uh, or the city is to drop, drop their leaves in the wintertime, allow sunlight to, to warm up the wall system. But in the spring and summer, when there's high heat loads on the wall, you'll have leaf growth on the vines and or the trees and help, help suppress some of that uh, the regular sunlight. Um, so let's look at some construction considerations. Uh, provide constructive assemblies that restrict obvious water and air transport through the wall. I'm going to talk about this um, quite a bit here. Review construction documents for details and completeness and ask questions. As, uh, as an engineer servicing the residential community, and, and Gordon, with a background in architecture and construction, we look at a lot of plans that are woefully inadequate in detail. Um, I would suggest that the builder community ask their designers for details. I believe that that is a big weakness in the connection between the design and the construction. Um, in fact, tremendous, they just, Plans often default to the code. The code, as we all know, is, is can be abstract or nebulous in some of these circumstances. So, Gordon, do you have any thoughts on, on any of that as well, or areas of well specific I'll, interest? I'll step up and say that I have been a designer of residential properties for over 40 years, and none of my plans have ever included flashing details, any, any of these kind of details, the details that need to be executed. And I would challenge anybody here in the audience to tell me if they've ever picked up a set of residential plans that have included details on how to flash conditions. John Gillery does it. Yes, he does. Well, okay. <laughs> John did perhaps. <laughs> Good. That's, that, that. that's a rare. It's very it's rare. rare. I've it seen some of I've reviewed some of John's right. plans. I've actually worked with him on a couple yeah. projects. But in the residential community, it just yeah. doesn't happen. I've gotten them from architects that my clients had in the right. city. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, John's go way beyond yes. what they do. And I will say, even from a, um, on a, on the commercial side, um, most, it's been my experience throughout my career that if you are presented with a really good detail that covers how you're going to layer these materials, flash this, do those kind of things, it usually comes in the way of a review shop drawing on a large commercial job. Yes. Anything short sure of that is, is, is non-existent. Okay. Um, I have even um, looking at a lot of the plans that are done for large commercial jobs, I see it in our office with our, our designers, our engineers. They do things on a CAD system. And when things are on a CAD system, you're looking at a detail that is blown up at you know a huge scale. But when it is actually printed and it's in the field to be executed, it is at a much smaller scale. And you're just looking at lines on a piece of paper. Um, it's very, very tough 
to see if it is even presented at all, it's it's tough to to see what is there. And that's why it goes back to you guys, boots on the ground. You've got to be there to make sure this gets done right. Because I know that we've gotten over the last 10 years pretty good at putting a flanged window into a WRB wall assembly and taping it correctly. We're light years ahead of where we were 20 years ago there. And that's pretty much wall assembly 101 for most competent crews now. But a lot of this other stuff is way too esoteric. These guys have not seen these details before and they don't know how to do it. And if you're relying on them to do it right, you're stepping off into a gray area that's going to come back to bite you. I agree. Agree. Thank you. Um, other construction considerations, uh, again, a, a recap of some open discussion here. Seal all exterior wall penetrations, especially at the WRB tape, and overlap all WRB joints. So, for our audience, WRB is weather resistant barrier, it's the actual periphery of the building that is managing uh, either bulk water or the migration of water from your wall assembly. Uh, elements that have been implemented in the construction industry lately uh, are within the last several years, I should say. Installing two layers of house wrap on the stucco clad walls with the outer layer to serve as a bond break between the stucco and the WRB. Yes, sir. I'll just ask this question for the audience. Is it ever okay to just put a single layer of stucco wrap on your stucco assembly? Not according to the manufacturer. No, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, you right. Put, you can put two layers of stucco wrap if you want to. Right. Thank you. So one layer. <laughs> uh, properly grade the surrounding lawn to transport water away from the building. Yes. Again, this this sentence here is is a, a comparable or complements the barrier system we discussed in the foundation just a few minutes ago. Very important to get the water away from the building. Install adequate ventilation of the attic and the crawl space with functional balance to intake and exhaust the air. Do not mix exhaust ventilation systems in the attic uh, as this can create ineffective results. So what does that mean? As an example, do not put grid vents and turbine vents or power vents to exhaust your attic in, in a single location on the roof system because it can create air turbulence and create an airlock thereby shutting down the entire attic ventilation from the lower part of your attic. So very important to pick a design system for exhaust ventilation and use that single system applicable to that region of your attic. If, you're, if your attic is partitioned and you have another section of attic, you can certainly change your attic vents, but one needs to be careful in mixing these ventilations. Yes, sir. I, one thing is when we talk about high, the, the efficiency of air conditioning systems, talking about attic ventilation, with the advent of the use of tech shield or the foil, or radiant foil on the bottom of the roof decking, all right? Yes. We have lowered attic temperatures down substantially, all right? We are now getting a lot of issues with the higher performance air conditioning systems condensating and really creating a real mold issue. Therefore, a lot of the two-speed two -speed systems have been said, no, don't do it. And if you're really going to prevent this water buildup in your air conditioning system, you got to warm your attics up. So they're telling us not to put as much ventilation if you're going to use the radiant foil. Thanks for bringing that up because that was a topic of discussion coming up. Okay. Let's talk. Are we about way it. Going? No, no, no. I'm, thank you for introducing it. Radiant foil uh, for the audience is basically considered a thin layer of aluminum foil mounted to the OSD that serves as your roof deck, just in simple lay terms. Um, and it does lower the attic of the temperature. What I have found, and actually with a client this past Monday, just three days ago, um, is that, to your point, the attic is cooler, the attic is not bending, and we're, we're, what we're doing is building up 
static air in this particular house, in this environment that we're in right now. And the ceilings, multi-speed or variable speed air conditioning system with fan lights in the ceiling, with, with, what I'm seeing is this hot, warm, trapped air in your attic is not being vented properly because of the cooler temperature, and it's actually being drawn into your house. The humidity levels are going up in your house. Air conditioning systems are sweating in, in the attics here. So, wow. And, so, and, then, and then you can get the fungal growth. I'm not supposed to say mold, but we don't know what that is. But that's exactly uh, a pathway for water condensation in your walls and ceilings <coughs> and subsequent fungal growth. So, good point. That's another example of changing assemblies not being compatible with the mechanical equipment that's being installed. Well, imagine a, a, a way to test this would be install a humidistat or something in the, uh, in the attic and, and monitor those levels. That is a good way to do it, uh, to, to monitor those levels. However, then you still gotta fix keep in mind the environment that this house is now functioning in changes over the course of time. If you live in a hot, humid environment, you're just fixed into that environment for several months here in the South. Um, and trying to change and work through that is, is a real problem. It's a real problem. Uh, I'm going to be looking at a building this afternoon that has, I suspect, the same problem, and I looked at one on Monday that has the same problem. Well, I don't know if we're going to get into it today because of time, but when we get into January 1 and the, the new coach steps in, I'm told by my AC people we're going to go up to R8 as a minimum on all our duct work. And the Sears are picking up again. Okay, so this whole thing with balancing the systems with attic temperature and ventilation is is a major thing. And, and, and the other thing that we're dealing with, because you talk a lot about the negative pressure when the systems come on. Okay, uh, I recently had a situation where my insulation contractor decided to, to shut it down because of his health. And I interviewed a couple of other contractors to take on the task. And one of the things I asked is, before you spray my attic, I'm asking you to put a man up there because the sheetrock is in, and every time he did a penetration around a light fixture, a biscuit box, an air conditioner register, that router did not seal. I mean, it's a, it's a hole, it's a gap. Right? You can get in the attic, but an attic, look down, and you can see the light. Yes. So I would get this insulator to foam seal every one of those penetrations. Just because air moves through fiberglass insulation all day long. Oh, yeah. It absolutely does. does. And so when you go into negative pressure, you're sucking that hot, moist air. You talked about our conditions. I mean, how many times has it been 80 degrees over the past few mornings at 5 o'clock in the morning? We have 97 percent humidity. That's what we have in our attic. Yeah, that's correct. And that's in the morning. It hasn't even heated up yet. Right. So we're going to we're going to get to in just a bit some of the uh, some discussion on that volume. So when you start looking at gas, air as a gas, when you start looking at some of the gas properties uh, from kind of a technical geeky side of things. Uh, I'm of the opinion that this hot, humid air in our attic is a steady volume, for the most part. It's not technically, but from a realistic and functional standpoint, it's a static condition. So as the temperature during the day rises and heats up that fixed volume, then the pressure rises. And when that pressure rises, to your point, it's driven through the insulation and through the ceiling sheet pump and into your house. Now, if we had functional attic ventilation, we would be exchanging that volume and reducing that pressure level. But under these current circumstances, and the way our environments are here in July and August, and anywhere, I guess, on the south, in the south, I think, I think that's a condition that needs to be considered in the design of the system and the construction of houses. I've studied this a lot. I don't have any 
any hard data on it, but these are these are circumstances that we see. I will go into people's houses and you can remove a picture or a frame, yeah. and there's mold on the back side. Right. Actually, I've seen it inside the picture and the photograph. How about when you go remove wallpapers? Yes, wallpapers and other there's mirrors. fine mirrors. I've actually seen it dripping off of lights on exterior walls when that when that vapor drives to the wall. That video of it. So let's continue. Uh, remember that exhaust ventilation will obtain makeup air from a path of least resistance. So building geometry may create air curtains, thereby restricting ventilation in an attic. So an air curtain. When you walk into department stores, one way that they when the doors slide open and you walk in, you get hit with this air. Most people just put the air down and they walk through this air curtain. Well, that's installed to manage the exchange of air. We forfeit some air instead of a lot of air, and it, it helps with climate control in that particular building. In attics, when one puts, for example, a, a turbine vent with a ridge vent, the turbine vent can spin and actually draw air through the ridge vent to service the turbine vent. So what's happening is you're creating this, this circulation of air and it blocks the lower attic air that's coming in through your sockets from getting out of the attic because the turbine is serviced by the ridge vent. I have actually seen negative pressure with power vents in an attic where we didn't have enough supply or any supply ventilation and the builder constructed the building absent of the supply exhaust and put three turbines on the roof system where did you get it excuse me three power vents not turbines power vents where it got its air from is the question other, from each other from inside the house from inside the house it received the air from the inside of the house this was this was a disaster. So to solve the problem, we put more power vents. So we had seven power vents. I don't know what the volume calculation was, but it was enormous. What we wound up doing as an experiment, we unplugged the power vents. So there was no exhaust of the attic, and then we plugged one in, and things seemed to function. We plugged the second one in, seemed to function. We plugged the third one in. And the four vents that were not plugged in, the blades in the vents started turning backwards. It was sucking air through those holes and servicing the power vents of the morning. So prior to that experiment, it was drawing air from inside the house. So air was coming from outside through the walls, through the house, and into the attic. Very, very grossly imbalanced, so much so that I took a photograph of water that was puzzled inside the dryer wow. of his house. Wow. So much negative draw. The hot air was coming through the dryer and through the dryer, the hot air was condensing on the air conditioned cold frame of the dryer. Mm -hmm. When I opened the dryer door, there was a puddle of water on the inside. Oh, okay. So just thinking of a specific example in my mind. There's some situations where you end up due to the structure of the home with a partially unvented attic space that cannot be serviced by other ridge vents. So you might would need to put in an additional set of ventilation within that same system. Is there a best practice or is there a distance uh, that would solve that? I'm curious. So so we're talking about we're talking about, if I could recap the question, we're talking about restricted attic space for ventilation. So let's say, for example, you've got a cathedral ceiling yes. that, that blocks, but there's no way to get a ridge vent in there, and you have a portion of the attic that is unvented. The rest of the house is perfectly fine, but you end up with a, a, a section that you're trying to figure out how to ventilate that, and it's, and it's different from the rest of the attic. Right, That's a, that is a big problem with current construction building practices. Um, and, and in my mind, it creates a, a pocket of dead, hot air. Mm -hmm. So it still needs to be vented. So one can put off ridge vents or uh, well, a turbine. He'll, he'll, or you could put a turbine, but I'd be cautious about a turbine, depending on the size and capacity of that 
the data airspace. Let's say you've got a, I don't know, a 1,200 cubic foot area. That is effective? That would be effective. Is that I, I think a yeah. turbine would probably be appropriate there. Okay. okay. What they're usually, um, in the image that I'm, I'm thinking of as you present this issue is a uh, upstairs bedroom blocks off maybe the corner of my house. Or yeah, they're smaller. And they're a smaller area. I would put maybe, what, in my mind, a bathroom vent cover or something there that would allow yeah. like I said, some exhaust yeah, yeah. capability. There, there's a provision that is showing up, or a condition that is showing up. Let me see if I can sketch this out here. Can everyone see? Um, here's the exterior of a wall. Here's a porch. And we may have a lower shed roof system yeah. here. Yeah. Okay. So to your point, Robert, this area here, in my mind, now this is a finished ceiling. Right. Finished ceiling. Typically in our community, this is an uh, expanded metal roof or yeah. something along those lines. Nice architectural feature. Some of us are familiar with this circumstance. Now, this is not a climate-controlled environment. It's an outdoor porch. This is an exterior wall. Here's a ceiling. So this is the first floor. This is the second floor. You with me? Yeah. What I have seen happen on more than one occasion is the air here in the roof frame over the front porch gets so hot it has no way to be exhausted. And to my knowledge, I don't think code requires it to be exhausted. But what happens is the temperature and the pressure drive the air into this living area. And I had seen it such that baseboards buckle and you can literally put your finger through the sheet box because it holds so much moisture. Even though in this wall assembly you put your insulation, you've done everything according to code, you're building up a very, what I, I see as a warm hot pocket of air. Yeah. And it has to get out somehow. By the way, this is a hot pocket of air and this is a climate controlled environment on the inside. You understand what I'm trying to portray? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this hot air in this region here drives in here, and I have literally seen these wall systems disassemble. Moisture crumble when they dry out because of because of this exchange, this thermal. So how do you propose to solve that issue? <clears throat> I thought about it. I've been especially if that, out of especially if that detail is facing the street. Yes. In front of that. Oh, so, yeah. one, okay. Different than on the back. So, I'm, I'm on the engineering side of things, not the architectural side of things. Cut me some slack here. <laughs> I think provisions can be possibly installed where some piping yes. comes yes. into this wall assembly, and this may be some sort of a vent up above this. You, there you could also follow a gable vent, or a right. shed gable, okay? Or you could maybe you put it on configuration of the building. Put it an off, off ridge vent here. I know these are building appliances that I see the looks that aesthetically give pause. I get it. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. They do make a ridge vent that fits along a wall like that. Do that? Yes. Is it, and then the along, wall, along this, yeah, along this. Some flashing goes on top of it. Hmm. What if you have a I like yeah. that concept. Then maybe you can put a trim feature. You put, a, you put your gate in flashing. Sounds to me like uh, you're asking for a hard, wind driven rain to create a moisture intrusion problem there. Where? Like, here? Well, no yeah, more than a rain or rich vent, though. Well, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, like a rich vent. Yeah. yeah, a moisture battle. Yeah. Well, I wonder if your second story wall could be constructed in such a way that it allowed that hot attic air in that shed attic to get into a cavity that goes up and goes into the attic above the second floor. Well, that's a thought. You system. would have to bring the ductwork all the way up to the attic region. Well, or if you frame the dummy wall, you frame the dummy wall. Double wall. That's yeah. what yeah. Yeah. Now, because the other problem that, that if you speak with a lot of insulation companies, Let's just say on your where you go from first to second story. Yes. Draw a 16-inch floor joist across there. I, that was my next step. Right? Yeah. Okay. The the drive. Yep. Into this interstitial space. Yep. Is phenomenal. Yeah. 
It is phenomenal. It's got to be and that's, a, that's a whole other class session. session. Yeah. But this circumstance right here is prevalent throughout the community. And yeah, it's on the outside. I don't care what range market your house is in. It is prevalent if there's a two-story building, it's prevalent throughout, and it creates phenomenal problems. Because that hot air will dry the building to your entire second floor. And think about those interstitials. What's installed? Bedrooms and bathrooms. Bathrooms require plumbing penetration, so now this hot air comes right here. Comes in, goes all the way, and it comes up into your house. It's a real, real problem. This, this region here, sorry about the sketch folks, but this really needs to be insulated though. It needs to be sealed with a piece of foam, it needs to be treated yeah. like an outside wall. Absolutely, yeah. because it is. It's exactly right. right. So thanks for bringing that up. That's a, that's a very critical uh, part of construction in this community. So. Um, when constructing exterior cladding, always consider how can water get, get through this cladding. Think, just look at the wall system before you put the veneers on and just, just consider that. Thermal, I'm gonna pick up the pace here. Thermal envelope construction uh, should be complete. Ceiling insulations should offer complete coverage, not almost complete coverage. Um, wall insulation should consume all of the wall cavity. Um, one of the things that really kind of irritates me is when I see a wall assembly just before it's getting ready to be closed up and the insulation is pushed in and it doesn't fill the whole volume of the wall. Those pockets of insulation depletion serve to just convey air, hot air and moisture. It just holds, it's just another little pocket to hold hot air and moisture. So evaluate and or seek professional opinions on HVAC capacity zoning and operations for the intended environment. Do not rely on so we've been doing this for 30 years. Dialogue. We talked about that a while ago. Manage pressure, excuse me, manage pressure differentials by having a well, well sealed HVAC system seal all the penetrations. And if you need to bring fresh air in, manage it that way. I've seen a couple of them lately on, on residential units where they bring some fresh air in. Not often, but it tells me that someone's thought through the process. Um, to manage thermal gradients, again, consider the city as trees and shrubs. Something, think about whatever the environment is that the house is being constructed. Try to cover that thermal influence. I'm going to ask Gordon to talk through this for about three or four minutes, if you could. This uh, detail that was constructed. Okay. I'll step aside. <laughs> <laughs> this, I've got a book of 